things up a little bit every year. Welcome to another episode of Open Mic. I'm Mike Morse along with Kevin Dietz. Hello, Kevin. Hey, Mike. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Good. You had some big news this week, huh? We had, we, yeah, we dropped some news this week that we're going to talk about uh, during this podcast with Chad Livingood and Denny Archer, who we had on about a month ago, that my law firm, as far as I have read, is the first law firm in Michigan uh, to give back the PPP money um, that was designated for small businesses. And it's created a stir from what I can tell. Yeah. I'm getting lots of uh, media inquiries, and there's been some articles, and uh, I'm not upset about the uh, stir. Obviously, we made the announcement because we wanted to encourage others to really take a good, hard look at these loans um, in this really, really flawed system uh, and these bad rules that they came out with to um, to think think really hard before the deadline came up to turn it back in. So that's what's happening in my world. And I think that'll be the major topic of today's podcast. You agree? Yeah. I mean, it was really, it, it went online and then uh, it, it got shared hundreds of times and the comments were burning up. Some people were mad and some people were glad and uh, it sure sparked a lot of conversation. So I think, I think we have a good, good talk about topic. I think, and I'm happy about the controversy and I, I'm not, um, I'm not upset about it. I think I think 98% of the comments I read uh, I read were uh, they got it, they understood it, they weren't mad. There were some misinformed people who thought, you know, why did I apply in the first place? Which I think we can get into today. Um, which I welcome those questions. So let's bring on our two guests who uh, really don't need an introduction. They're both pillars in our community. Chad Livingood from Cranes. Detroit and Denny Archer, who's, you know, like I said, was on our podcast and has got his hands on a lot of things Detroit. Um, so I thought they, these two gentlemen would, would be great to help in this discussion and shed some light on it. So both of you, welcome to Open Mic. Thanks for having me back. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course. So as you guys heard us in the introduction talking about the PPP program, I know, Chad, your uh, uh, magazine wrote an article about it this morning and has written lots and lots of articles about this flawed PPP program. Um, are you surprised that I'm uh, that my law firm was has been the only one to publicly announce that it's that we uh, that we decided to turn it turn it back in? Well, law firms are private companies, and they sometimes keep a lot of their business transactions private. So. Um, um, I, I guess it's a little surprising, but uh, I'd be kind of curious to understand a little bit about why you needed it. What was the business reason at the time? Uh, and, and what is going on with your business in general, uh, given that you know life has kind of st stood still for quite a while here? It's a great, great, great way to start this, Chad. Um, well, you know, the CARES Act was passed on March 27th. The first guidance that came out after that was on March 31st, and there was nothing really in the guidance. The first opinions came out on 4-1 that said you must apply by 4-3. So, and this is when my office had been shut down for two weeks, nobody's on the roads, the courts are completely closed, and I had no idea. I mean, we were, we were talking layoffs. Um, I had 45 lawyers. I don't have to tell you the amount of payroll that I have, but it's in it's over $10 million a year easily. And we didn't, we didn't know. I mean, am I, am I, yes, we have a successful law firm, but am I supposed to go into my savings account and pay all these people? Um, but the government said, don't lay anybody off. Uh, we're here to help you. Uh, my bank and the treasury department is saying, apply, apply, apply immediately without any information or guidance. And then uh, my CPA and my CFO and my COO are saying, we're applying, we're applying. And we applied. And we didn't know if we were going to get the money. We were just told every business in America is applying, apply. 
So it, it was chaotic. It was uncertain. And a lot of the word was uncertain and need. And heck, we're a law firm and the courts are closed. We're an auto accident firm and there's nobody driving. So I, I, I think, I mean, if we weren't the definition of uncertainty, um, I don't know what is. So that's what was going on. I mean, it was, it was crazy uncertain times. And I know we're only talking six weeks ago, uh, but it was really, really uncertain. Dennis, Dennis, is that uh, similar to what you guys were experiencing in like the restaurant world? Um, I mean, that because because like you said, it was six weeks ago, but time just changes. <laughs> you know, your your thoughts and emotions just can really yeah. So change me, in the in the course of. Let me say the following first. Um, I think it'll be very interesting uh, when we do a post analysis, maybe in a year or two from now to actually measure and determine the successful nature or not of the CARES Act and the resulting PPP program. I think it was well-intentioned. I think that without some sort of um, timely action by the federal government, that the economy would have plummeted in a, in a very terrible way. So let me say that at the outset. Um, our experience in the businesses that I'm involved in uh, they all applied. Uh, they were all successful, and different businesses find them and find themselves in a different state. So, obviously, for the restaurant, we are mandated by law to be fully closed right now, with no guidance as to when we can reopen. And so, um, the assistance is is very welcoming. As was welcome there. If you look at our other operating companies. Um, where we w did apply for PPP, uh, they are in different levels of decline, not catastrophic decline, but decline. And so there's been a lot of criticism about larger companies that took money, universities that with tremendous amount of dry powder, if you will, by the way of endowment funds, took money and gave back. Let me say two things, one in general, one about uh, Mike in particular. First, having sat on a, a bank board for a number of years and participated in the loan committee, I've learned never to count anyone else's money. And so, you know, when you sit in that position, you're privy to information when people are coming before you for a loan about their personal net worth, their liquidity, their income and that sort of thing. And, you know, you would always see, in my estimation, people, you were shocked that they had that much depth in their balance sheet. Then you would see people who move around about town, you know, like they're a Rockefeller and you don't have any liquidity. And so you can never, if a guy's got commercials, if a guy's doing whatever he's doing, you, you can't count someone's money. And so, and you, and you don't know, to Mike's point, you know, what his bankability is, what the liquidity is, you know, how much money there is to cover his $10 million plus payroll. I don't think the way that this law was written, maybe this is me as a capitalist, if someone applies within the confines of the act and within the rules of the program and they are awarded money by following the rules and they are going to put that money to the use in accordance with the rules, to me, it doesn't matter how much that person makes, how much they have in liquidity, because they are following the law. It's much like taxes. Uh, if you have an issue with the fact that Warren Buffett's assistant make, pays more taxes than Warren Buffett, don't be mad at Warren Buffett. Change the tax law. And so as relates to Mike, I, I'm not seeing any of the scuttlebutt, Mike, as it relates to people maybe having something negative to say about you giving it back. But I agree, and in, in, in as you stated the facts and outlined the dates, it makes completely sense. It makes complete sense. I think everybody's accounting professionals said, "Hurry up, apply for the money before it's gone," um, amidst trying to make an analysis. And so, you know, Mike Scurry applied, was successful, then subsequently made an analysis and said, "You know what? We're going to give the money back because there may be people that need it more than us." I don't think that he should have given it back or was required to give it back, but I applaud that he did give it back. Mike, uh, what was the analysis that you 
did that you, you or your CPAs and such concluded we don't need this or we can do without and 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 continue forward when you're talking about balancing your payroll and and right. the downturn in business that you have well it, you know Chad we were pleasantly surprised that our phones did not stop ringing and we were able to keep our advertising on. We, um, the phones started ringing. We were still signing up cases. I didn't think there were people on the roads, but apparently there are. There are social security matters. There are dog bite matters. There are other things happening. So we were still signing up cases, okay? I did not think we were going to do that. Or I, it, nobody knew. The other thing that was unknown and uncertain and scary was that the courts were closed and are closed. Now, I've been practicing almost 30 years and the courts have never been closed in my 30 years. So we're trial lawyers, can't have trials. Um, we don't think we're gonna have trials maybe again this year. So that's, that's how we keep uh, pressure on the insurance companies is that we're gonna try the case and that's why we settle so many cases because we're good trial lawyers and there was no trade trials. I didn't know if I was going to be able to make payroll and it's been what, five, six, seven weeks. We're signing up cases and we are settling cases, not at the same rate, uh, but we are settling a good amount of cases. We have enough for payroll. Um, of course, I've read the news articles and I've seen the big corporations and have looked at those um, unfavorably as well. And I thought to my, and I, and I have read the stories that some ungodly number, 80 plus percent of the really small businesses that really, really needed these loans didn't get them. Mm -hmm. And that was, it seemed unfair to me. So my CPA, my CFO, my COO and I sat down virtually and they challenged me and, and we talked about it and they said, what if we give it back? And I said, well, what does that mean? How does that work? Are there, uh, can we do that? Are we sure we should do that? In my business, the cases we're working on right now are a year to two to three years old. So just the nature of my business. I'm not a criminal defense attorney or a divorce attorney. So if somebody came to me today for a drunk driving, that's immediate. It has to happen today. And I'll build today for the next six weeks of work. The auto cases and truck cases that I have are two years old, year and a half old, six months old. So we're busy. My team is actually working hard. And the fact that they're settling cases is also, like I mentioned, surprising. So money's coming in. I'm able to make payroll. And I decided that I wanted other businesses to get this money. If I could personally give it to them, I would, but I got to give it back to the government or back to the bank that gave it to us. The bank will then uh, hopefully find new recipients of this money. I also learned, Chad, that over $10 billion of this of these loans were given to the banks. And I was actually with a banker uh, last week who told me that one reason that the big loans got filled earlier than the smaller loans is because they made a percentage on the money that they gave out. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I, 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 didn't, I, didn't know, I didn't see that in the fine print. It didn't matter really. But the banks, if they gave away a million or $2 million, they got the same percentage as if they gave away $25,000. So from a business standpoint, it makes sense to give away the one to $2 million easier than the 25, 50,000, which is the same amount of paperwork, the same amount of grief, less money. So I, I thought that was a bad loophole. I think, I think the fact that they're changing the rules all the time for these things is bad. Um, I don't think, like, like Danny said, I think that the, the intention was good. They, this was way too fast. And I don't know if Chad or Denny said this, but you know, I think Denny said that that if this didn't happen, imagine our economy. And I always have questions. And maybe Chad, you're the person to talk about it since you're the business writer and you know you're smarter than I am about this stuff. But I'm not seeing. I mean, what would the numbers be? They're they're, they're the worst numbers ever. Like, what would the numbers be if the CARES Act didn't happen? I'm sure you can't really answer that. But what would the numbers be? Unemployment rates are the worst ever. Um, but yet all this money went out to retain people. What would they be if the money didn't go out? Restaurants. I mean, there was an article today about Avalon Bakery or not today. It was last week in the New York Times. And she said, I got a loan 
but I can't bring my people back just to fire them again. So her people are on uh, are on unemployment, yet she has this loan. So I don't I, I I'm I'm confused of what this money is actually really doing. Is it, it you know would the would the numbers be much worse without it? And I guess I'm asking you, Chad. What what do you think about that? Well, I think the government took a uh, two pronged approach here. They tried to have, we're going to enhance unemployment. They added the six hundred dollar a week pandemic uh, benefit for anybody. They extended it they extended unemployment to uh, ten ninety nine contractors, which is probably the first time the Congress has really acknowledged that our economy is heavily heavy on ten ninety nine contractors in these days, but more so than it was. 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, and and so then they came up with this loan package idea that, hey, this is an alternative to just laying off your entire workforce um, and you can borrow this money and, and possibly get some of it forgiven uh, in order to um, uh, in order to to keep 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 things uh, sustained while we are in this shutdown for an un uh, known amount of time, and and so uh, the uh, these these programs, you know, conceived kind of like you know, um, in a, in a shotgun setting essentially, um, and and they they went forward with it, and and um, um, and I think there's also some some motivation from the 08 crisis that in the 08 crisis they just wrote big checks to uh, Bank of America and J.P. Morgan Chase and, and company and such. Uh, and just handed over the banks a whole host of money and the little guys uh, or even the medium guys like yourself didn't really have a uh, didn't have really have an avenue to um, to tap into uh, for a you know quote unquote bailout but um, you know one, one of the issues guys that is has come about and it's it's been talked about in more circles different circles is that the inequitable nature of the distribution of these funds and so if you look at, again, Mike's point about the banks uh, being, yeah, they got 5%, I think, of the fee of the money that they uh, loaned out. And that that's how they were able to monetize their participation. But the other thing that was happening in, in terms of maybe perhaps being driven by larger transactions, thus larger fees, is that if a bank has a relationship with Dennis Archer Jr. and he's, they've got a number of loans and lines of credit out with Dennis, they're going to go to give that money to Dennis first and prioritize him because they want to make sure Dennis's business is healthy so that he can continue to pay those outstanding liabilities he has back to the bank. And so for a small business person that probably needs the money more, but that does not have a banking relationship with a significant institution, they get left out because now they're scurrying to go open an account so they can have a relationship and they're way down the totem pole. People that had significant relationships with credit unions. Credit unions don't typically have a good relationships or relationships with the SBA historically. And so if that has been your bank, uh, because banking relationships with credit unions are, are very, very beneficial. But if that has been your bank of choice for the past 15 or 20 years, then you also are left in a bind. And so, you know, note to self for younger entrepreneurs by not age, uh, you know, by the age of your birthday, but by age of your business, it's very important to go out and establish banking relationships, even if it's just going and giving the bank manager a cup of coffee so that when it comes time for something like this in the future, you have a relationship with a bank. If you go all up and down the proverbial main streets through Detroit and even throughout our suburbs, the smaller business people without relationships who need the money most were left out. Mike, going back to your original question, you know, there's 33 million people uh, on unemployment are out of out of work right now. Without the PPP loans, it might have been 100 million. I mean, we don't know the exact number, but what what you do in a in in a uh, a police situation? Say say there's a a, a gunman at a school. Uh, what the police do is they send everybody. You send everybody and then you find out some information and then you bring people back. You say, oh, we don't need this squad. We don't need this uh, squad. We don't need the tank. We don't need all this stuff. I, I feel like the government said, send everything, send everything, get people money and then evaluate what is needed. And I think that you're kind of at that point where like your business, you looked at it and you said, OK, 
Uh, we, we don't need it. Go ahead. Go back to the precinct. And I don't know if the government has set up a, a situation for businesses to assess where they're at right now, whether they need that money or not. I, I, I understand there's some deadlines to give that money back. I don't know if the deadlines are such a good idea or not. I mean, I don't know how you everyone can assess whether they need it or not. I mean, I would want to say, geez, I don't know. Let me find out if I need it. You know, I, I, I it would be hard. It'd be a hard decision to say I'm just not going to accept this money and then lose your business because you didn't. I, it, it's it's a tough question. I, I'm not sure there's an answer there, but it's it, it's tough. Yeah, today is actually the deadline for this safe harbor uh, deadline to re if you had a loan of $2 million or less to return it. Um, and I, I don't know who in the federal government decided that date because, you know, not not every business is 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 uh, is reopened yet. Um, if you are a construction contractor who just reopened a week ago today, it's and you're getting back and you had canceled jobs that were going to be scheduled for August or, or the fall uh, because people just canceled contracts and construction projects. Um, you don't really have a full sense of, of whether your business is going to be the same uh, yet. Uh, and so that's, that's, that's just a questionable issue on the federal government standpoint and in the bureaucracy from the small business uh, administration. You know, Kevin, the other place where I think it is, sorry, Mike, is where there's going to be a cluster is when it comes time for there to be a decision as it relates to uh, is it a grant or does it convert into some 24 month loan at 1% is, you know, determining whether people are hitting the thresholds of 75% payroll, 25% rent and other utilities and how that's being measured, how much of that is subjective. And I think I, I'm not sure if the uh, administrators of this are ready for that onslaught of determinations. Denny, what I was going to ask you was with a restaurant, you're not open. Your PPP loan is supposed to be for payroll mostly. How, hey, what do you, how are you dispersing that money? I assume your employees are collecting unemployment. Um, how, how does that work? So when we, when this first happened, we put um, all of our uh, hourly workers, uh, as soon as we realized we were not gonna be open, we put them, Mike, uh, on unemployment. Everyone got on successfully. Our management team, we carried um, for a period of time, uh, remaining on payroll, because we still had them working, because at that point, we didn't recognize or know when we'd be coming back to work we're likely going to bring people back in the reverse. And so we, again, will bring our, our managers back on sooner, uh, which hopefully is going to be very shortly in days. And then the hourly workers, you know, will come back on for training in this new environment prior to opening. All that has got to be triggered, obviously, in terms of the hourly workers, which is floor and back a house, by when the governor says that we can open, accompanied by when workforce will be downtown. Because if she says that restaurants can open at X percent on June 15th, but the Quicken Family Loans of companies says they're not bringing employees downtown till September, then it may not be prudent for us to open June 15th, whether we can or not. And so all of those determinations are playing a role. Uh, and that will then affect, to, to answer your question directly, how we deploy those funds. And that will also affect, for us, how much of that those funds will be grant versus a short-term loan that we will have to pay back. You know, I think Jackie Victor's point in her New York Times article or op-ed was that there's a deadline to give away that money. I think it was mid-June. And uh, I read it this morning. And and so I think she was, she was advocating that those deadlines get pushed for restaurants like yours mm -hmm. because I think, I mean, I've heard from many, many hourly employees uh, and and lower salaried people that they're making more money not working than they were working. Have you guys heard the same types of things? Yeah, particularly with that $600 enhancement. And, and Chad, you would know better than I exactly when that runs out. But yeah. I, I would say that for our hourly folks and, and for our folks who went on unemployment, uh, with the exception of one, and that one would be our highest paid employee. I'm speaking only about the restaurant now. Um, most of those people are right about where they were when they were working a full schedule. 
Yeah, so that uh, $600 a week pandemic uh, benefit from the federal government, that goes until the end of July. And so it's it's tacked on to the state benefit of about of maximum of $362 a week. And and so, um, yeah, there are people, that's, that's the equivalent of $24 an hour. And I'm sure there's a lot of people in a lot of restaurants who make way less than that. There are a few people who make up upwards 24, but not a lot. And, and so in, in the service sector, this is really uh, the challenge is both trying to get uh, the employees put together in order to, and then also then prove that you're a safe business and you've got safety protocols in place in order to make sure that people don't get sick uh, or, or, or spread uh, COVID-19 in your workplace. Uh, and, um, and so it, that's, that's the one challenge. Now the state has actually come up with a, a program. I wrote about this this week in, in Cranes. Uh, um, it's called WorkShare, where you can actually bring someone back part-time um, you can be and reduce their hours or normal hours between 10 and 60%. And so you, you can then get 10 to 60% of the unemployment benefit from the state plus the $600 a week uh, benefit. And so uh, it, the, the, the ex example that uh, the state gave me was someone makes $52,000 a year, 1000 bucks a week, easy kind of way to figure out the math. Um, they can, that person can get about $126 a week from state unemployment if they go to 65% of their hours. And then they get the $600 and then they get 65% of, of their $1,000 normal wage. So they can make upwards of nearly $1,400 a week working and drawing partial unemployment versus um, uh, what their normal uh, wage was of $1,000 a week. Or their um, unemployment benefit of nine sixty two a week. So I think you're going to see the state try to try to push this. The other thing that the state wants to push this is because um, they are the the federal government is paying the bill uh, because uh, it seems that um, uh, Congress has uh, you know unlimited spigot of, of money and uh, and so they're going to pick up the entire bill for this unemployment benefit under the work share program. Um, and so the state is trying to do that so they can preserve the, the state's uh, unemployment trust fund. One of the things that I think you're gonna see, and I saw Joe Vicari was on the news being interviewed this weekend and they have 26 or so, 22 or 26 restaurants on the Amo franchise, is that he felt as though there would probably be some form in the restaurant hospitality business that you would fill out that says, you know, Dennis, Kevin Dietz is on uh, unemployment presently furloughed from Central Kitchen and Bar, but I would sign a form that said, I offered Kevin Dietz his job to come back and Kevin Dietz is not coming back. And so then that, that would be a problem for Kevin as it relates to his unemployment benefits. Yeah, there's going to be a lot about uh, what is disclosed and what isn't disclosed. I know that a congresswoman in uh, California, uh, Katie Porter, is introducing a bill on this PPP money uh, where uh, there's full disclosure whether you're a company or not. Uh, and it's interesting that that could be enacted after people decided whether or not to take the money. Some people uh, might not take the money if they have to publicly declare uh, what their situation was. Uh, so it, it's really an odd situation where you don't know what the rules are, uh, but if you accept the money, you may be obligated to follow them uh, even afterwards. Yeah, a lot, a lot of this doesn't make sense. I'm not a politician. I don't want to be a politician, but the fact that people, you know, why would they rush back to work if they're making 40% more money by sitting at home? That doesn't make a whole bunch of sense. Uh, especially when there's businesses not getting them getting, you know, money to stay open. I, I just doesn't make a whole bunch of sense to me, but I keep hearing from, I keep hearing that over and over. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I mean, I know there's an article in the paper that uh, the first uh, criminal case, federal criminal case was made against some guys out East who uh, had fictional 45 employees that they were collecting PP money for, and uh, they were charged with conspiracy. And And it'll be interesting 
later on, like you said, Dennis, a year from now, what how this is looked at, and will will there be a lot of federal investigations into where the money went and who actually needed it, and how is that determined? And it's just it, it's kind of a mess. But I do understand that uh, with the economy and the situation it was in, you had to you kind of had to flood the system. And and I don't know if it's like uh, everybody's on the honor system or not, but that's not a great way. To, I don't want my tax dollars out there on the honor system. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a tough, tough way to go. It is. So what anybody hear what happened today in Lansing? I know that there was supposed to be some kind of protest. Has that happened yet today? Or uh, is that happening in a little bit? Yeah, I think that, uh, Mike, they were up there today. Not as many people. Now, mind you, I was on a, on a, a Zoom call, so the news was in the background, but the headline sort of was that there was not as many people, didn't look as crowded, and just visually looking at the screen, there didn't seem to be as many armed individuals uh, up there during that protest either. A little bit of rain kind of might have washed things away a little bit. Right. Good point, Chad. That's, it was raining pretty hard, I bet, in Lansing. Uh, I'm not too far from there that, that the weather got – got bad um and so they, they they i saw something quickly on the news this morning that they were going to arrest people who showed up with guns even though they didn't pass that law saying guns were not allowed in the capitol i'm not sure i was i've been tuned out uh, on other projects today so um i guess we'll find out but uh, these these protests are you know kind of they're kind of fading off a little bit from that initial big operation gridlock uh, when they ever, everybody drove drove to the Capitol just to, you know, gum up all the streets of Lansing. So, you know, I think that, I think that if you look at, um, you know, a lot of those protests were rooted in the fact that many of the residents, um, maybe in the western and northern part of the state, felt that the statewide um, rulings by the governor in terms of stay home, business being closed, et cetera, were unfair, unwarranted because this pandemic has not manifested itself as much in their geography. I think much like the success of the PPP program, the reaction of state and local leadership in two or three years from now will be more appropriately measured. And when you look at someone like, uh, and I don't know, don't know what everyone's politics are, but in my opinion, if you look at someone like Governor Whitmer versus the governor in Georgia and those two very different approaches, uh, it won't be until you see how that, what the health effects and the economic effects are of those decisions down the line when you look back. But, you know, for me, I've been asked a multitude of times uh, as relates to when do I think restaurants should be able to open? Are we rushing to get back open? And I can say that I think that a more conservative approach because we're dealing with a health pandemic for which there is no antidote presently uh, is a better approach. I do think that we are going to see more regionalization in, our, in the approach. Um, I do think there's some merit for people in Traverse City or the western part of the state where there has not been uh, as much infection. They, they make a good argument to say, you know, we should be able to be open for business. We should be able to go over a friend's house Maybe we should be able to look to open our restaurants and hotels because there's not a significant as an issue. So I would suspect in the next couple of weeks that as uh, our governor goes to continue to open the economy, as people are referring to it as, that you'll see a more regional approach to that. Chad, I don't know what your feelings are on that. Yeah, I mean, three weeks ago she came out and said there was going to be a regional approach, and we haven't seen that yet. So. Um, every every uh, step down, you know, from landscaping to construction to manufacturing to the to the to the assembly plants reopening next week, it's all been on a statewide basis. So, um, still kind of uh, still kind of watching for that uh, regional approach. But hey, guys, I gotta jump off. I got another call coming, uh, but it was uh, nice talking to you all. You too, Chad. Thank you for joining us. All right, take care. So, De Danny, let's talk about the restaurant. Um, you know, I have friends in Arizona, and they their restaurants opened in the last few days. Mm -hmm. um, I have friends going to the restaurants. Some are crowded. Some are doing a better job of social distancing. And the ones who are crowded, they feel like it feels like old times, and it feels good. The ones that are 
um, social distancing feels weird and eerie, and that's not why you go to restaurants. No. I got a sense that's where you're leaning until you could be full bore. Uh, it, it, I, I don't know if I would come. Uh, if I have to sit six feet apart, the waitress comes over with a mask on. I don't know. I'm, I, I'm, 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 uh, I think I'd be hesitant, and a lot of people I know would be hesitant until. But I think there would be people who would come. So I don't. I mean, I don't know where I am. I'm on the fence. You guys, but it sounds like you want to wait until you can get a little bit, some more bodies in the restaurant before you open. Yeah, and so you know, for us, um, we're fortunate that we're in a place we got no income and no expense, and so we're just sitting, waiting to flip a script. Our managers have worked very diligently on what a go back to work um, from an operation standpoint, what that looks like in terms of uh, protocols that we'll have to start following. The National Restaurant Association, as well as the Michigan Restaurant Hospitality Association, have both put out very thorough guidelines and protocols that one would follow in reopening under under this condition. But, you know, for me, the whole reason, Mike, we started the restaurant in the first place is because there are those of us who really like to go out for a good meal and have great drinks. And we didn't really at the time, there wasn't a place like that in downtown Detroit. And so from my perspective, me going to a restaurant where my server has on gloves and perhaps a mask and there's, you know, maybe I have to wear a mask until my meal comes. That's not the experience that one looks for when, when, you, when you go out. And so we're taking a position, one, the governor has to say it's legal. Right now it's not. When she does decide that restaurants can open and under what parameters, for instance, 25 or 50 percent, um, that's another consideration we have to take into um, our decision. But mostly for us, because downtown doesn't have uh, a large, dense residential uh, population, a lot of this when are people coming back to work because the large employers downtown, most of them, like your practice, they're operating in this condition with people working from home. Uh, you know, Quicken Loans uh, had their best uh, month in history in March. Part of that month was affected by this. April, uh, they were projecting to be better than March and because the interest rates are lower, a lot of people are re refinancing. But if they're having that success with thousands of people at home, then they're not gonna bring the people downtown until it's safe to do so. I don't know when that is, but it's not until those people come downtown that we can have uh, the, mo the most robust business possible. And so we're sitting on the sidelines, we're communicating with the city and just following what the governor is saying. And we wanna have an enjoyable, safe experience when you come back to Central, as close as that that you were getting when you were coming before. It won't be the same, we know that, but it's close to there too. When you when you look at the business side of it, Dennis, uh, the margins, um, I, I think about a restaurant and every square foot, you know, you want filled with people eating and drinking. And and I think of a restaurant with six feet apart, social distancing mm -hmm. rules. And and I just wonder how many restaurants can actually make money if they're only using a, a third of, of their space that are it was designed for people. So an average restaurant would make that serves, you know, a restaurant that's heavily food based in terms of revenue will make between five and 10 percent net income earnings at the end of the year. Um, a lot of those costs are fixed. Rent's fixed. Um, your back of the house costs, although hourly they're fixed during the hours of operation. Some of your front of house hostesses are fixed. Um, if you have any equipment leasing costs, those are fixed. Then you have your variable costs, your floor staff, your food, your beverage expense. But, you know, if you say you can have half the people, so our capacity is 130. And so if you say our, now our capacity is 64 or whatever, 65, and then you've got to spread those people around the restaurant, you still need the same probably amount of people in the kitchen. Um, your rent, unless the landlord is going to do something about it, when it kicks back in, it's going to be the same. So a lot of those fixed expenses are the same. So to be able to eke out that 5 or 10%, with perhaps 50% less revenue is going to be very tough, which is why, you know, I've seen estimates with as much as 40 or 50% of restaurants, even if they try to come back when they can open, 
will not make it past three months. And so we're being very cautious and conservative about when we pull that trigger to come back to work. Hmm. Any Anything you're hearing, any guesses you want to publicly make as to when we're going to see some sort of normalcy in the restaurant business or, or things open to an enjoyable level? Yeah, I think that... I would guess, but I mean, it's a, it's a wide range, but I would say between June 15 and July 15, that restaurants will be able to open with some percentage. My guess is 50% along with the other guidelines. No more people, no more tables than four tables are six feet apart. If you look at what the hospitality um, businesses have done in Asia, for example, uh, where they're far ahead of us in this timeline, those are the types of things that they've been doing. And so uh, I think that mid June to mid July that people will be able to open with some restriction. Mike and Kevin, you know, when we get back to hundred percent capacity, boisterous three, three people deep at the bar shouting for a drink, that could be next year. I mean, that could be next year, unfortunately. Scary. Yeah, don't you feel like, don't you kind of feel like people are going to wait until the winter to see if this thing comes back before they jump in and get into a really crowded bar and situation? I mean, that, that's kind of my gut feeling. I want to let people come back, see if this if this thing comes back, if it has a second wave before I want to you know go out there and, and really mix it up like that. Yeah, I think the nature of one's business and what the what the mix of business that you had uh, will contribute to that. If you take neighborhood places like Market or Lux in Birmingham or where everybody knows everybody, I think those places will fill up quicker because there's a lot of familiarity. Um, even with us at Central, we have a lot of regulars. And so those regulars we're keeping in contact with by phone, by social media, newsletters, et cetera. I think the regulars will be back. But that other business that you were getting, the business traveler. The people coming down for games. I mean, we're not going to have fans in arenas or stadiums for at least, I would say, a year. I don't think there'll be an opening day in March of next year because I think that the governor has made it fairly clear that until there's an anecdote, having 25 to 60,000 people that don't know each other sitting on top of each other for hours at a time is not a good idea. And so there are a lot of restaurants downtown Ours, we got some, but it was not uh, completely reliant on it, where, you know, a lot of their business came from games and sports and theater and concerts. And so you don't have 80, 80 Lions games, 40 Pistons games, 6 to 10 Lions games are not going to happen this year as relates to the fans. So that's also going to give the business a hit. And so um, I think the shakeout here for those that open is going to go through the winter um, because, you know, I think there'll be some exuberance as it relates to the reopening um, when it when it happens through the rest of the fall, through the holidays, Christmas, etc. But I think when you get to January and there are no football or basketball games, there had been no baseball games, the months are colder, business falls off anyway because of the weather and coming off of New Year's Eve through March. I think that's the January, February, March is where I think you'll see a lot of shakeout in the business. You've given me like just as you were talking, Denny, I'm picturing everybody at Comerica Park with a mask on. Yeah. And, and then I'm thinking, well, how, how am I going to eat my hot dog and drink my right. beer? Right. Uh, it, which probably brings in most of the revenue. Um, and what a horrible thought that that i mean i mean you could probably do that right if everybody sat in a lions game or, or a tigers game with with masks on but who the heck wants to do that um i'm not that diehard of a fan to to be willing to do that right uh but those are some long timelines that i hope you're wrong me too um, actually and uh i know you do I, I i know you do and i hope what do you you know i as we're, i think i probably asked you this 30 days ago i'm gonna ask you again you know there's been a lot of pressure and press on on, on our governor. Um, I saw some poll that over 70% think she's doing a good job, mm -hmm. which I was, you know, there's a, there's a loud minority. Well, you think she's playing it right? Or you think she's a little too conservative? Well, so I live in Detroit. My businesses are in Detroit. And um, we are obviously very uh, disproportionately affected. 
And so I would say I personally, given my circumstance and my community, immediate community would give her an A+. Having said that, though, I do understand how people who have a different circumstance than I, who live on the far western side of the state, who live in the UP, could feel like they are being treated unfairly. And so uh, I have no critique of what she's done to date. I believe that a cautious approach is a better approach. Um, I, I know people, um, uh, several who have died, uh, a few of which are, you know, my age. So uh, younger cats, as I, I mean, I guess I consider myself still young considering. But, and so, I do think that a lot of that, if she in a, in a, in a short form, uh, short term comes with a regionalization approach as part of her next announcements, I think a lot of that neg negativity will go away. And I think people will, will probably forget when election day comes um, in several years off. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you for another robust discussion about this stuff. Denny, as always, I appreciate it. We'll have you back on again soon. Thank you I very much. to be in... Uh, your beautiful restaurant, Central Kitchen and Bar, very, very soon having a drink and uh, some of those fish tacos that I like uh, you. with you. And uh, hopefully not as late as you're predicting, but uh, Fingers sometime crossed. next summer. All right. Thanks. All again. right, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. All right, Kevin. Uh, any parting thoughts? No, I think uh, I think it was good. I think it was good to get on and talk a little bit about it. People uh, uh, asked why, you know, why did you apply for it? Well, hey, you, nobody knew what in the world was going on, so you applied for it. Why'd you give it back? Because you were able to, uh, and yeah. you think other people need it more. Um, you know, I, I think I, uh, it's good to talk about uh, some of the questions people raise. I, listen, I, I welcome the questions. It's, it's listen, it wasn't easy on me. It wasn't an easy decision. To actually give it back, I'm not gonna. I don't want to. I don't want people to have that uh, feeling that this any of this was easy. Applying was a decision. Giving it back was a decision. In a year and a half, I may wish I had that money because I'm gonna have a lull in cases because nobody's driving for months and months and months. Right. So, but my gut, my heart was this is the right thing to do. That other businesses and people need it more than me. I did the right decision. Uh, it. it Applying was, I think, the prudent thing to do. I think it would have been negligent for my employees not to have applied. So I'm happy I applied. I'm grateful that I got the money. And I made the decision that other people can use it uh, more than me. And that's kind of the sum of it. And people will judge as they always do. And But hopefully that money... More importantly, hopefully that money will get into the hands of people so they can stay in business and, you know, so the money can be used for the intended consequences. And hopefully other businesses like mine will step up and return the money to help our community because I got a lot of years left to live here and I want I don't want businesses to close. So that's really uh, the heart and soul of it. I wish I wish we could convince uh, the banks to give fifty percent of their fees back, uh, pump another five billion uh, back into the fund. <laughs> I mean, had had the government said to the banks, "We'll let you administrate this or administer this for two and a half percent," like you just suggested, you think they would have turned away five billion dollars in fees for really not doing a whole bunch? Nope, not. I at think all. they would have done it. Yep. So I don't know who's negotiating on their behalf, but <laughs> anyway. I Thanks for being here, Kevin, and right. uh, until next time, thanks for watching Open Mic. Please share and like this podcast and subscribe to our YouTube channel so we know you like it. We'll keep producing some good content for you. And if you have questions or comments, please get them to us at Mike at 855-MIKE-WINS, as well as other things that will pop up and tell you where to email and text us. So stay safe, and thanks for listening and watching. You never know who you're going to see. Be one guy one-on-one -on -one my whole career. What you're going to hear. You got a lot of desperate people in the city. On my podcast, Open Mic. Find it where you find your podcasts.